How much sleep did you get last night? Can you catch up on sleep? Is the world set up for early birds to succeed? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life of Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm Lavanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when Lavanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. So I have a question for you, Lindsay. All right. Do you know our logo and the little numbers in it? I love the little numbers in it, so absolutely. Which of those numbers is your favorite? So there's this little number six. I think it's purple. (laughs) Yeah, he's right at the end. He's like really frazzly looking. He looks like he's at a rough night. (laughs) (laughs) That is my favorite one because there's just times when you're working on a podcast or school or just life where you really feel like that number six. So that one's my favorite. (laughs) I really connect with our little number eight. (laughs) That one is very cute. And does he have glasses? I'm pretty sure he's wearing glasses. I really like him. Mm -hmm. I like him too. Yeah. And he kind of inspired this mini series that we're putting together over these three episodes. He did. Yeah. So we're just really going to be talking about the number eight and where it appears in our everyday lives. There'll be three episodes that we're calling our eight by eight by eight mini series. Um, We'll talk about eight hours of sleep, eight cups of water a day. And what was our last one? The eight hour work day. Oh, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have a question for you. Yeah. How much sleep did you get last night? We're recording on a Sunday. So on the weekend, I typically get more sleep than during the weekdays. Like, I got like a good 10 hours in last night. But if you were to ask me that during the week, it would be closer to like six to seven hours of sleep. Yeah, I feel that. On weekends, I can't help but, you know, turn off the alarm and just see what happens. I mean, if the recommendation is eight hours of sleep a day, I don't think I get that every day. There's times where I have trouble sleeping if there's something like the next day that I'm really excited about or nervous about. Mm, For some reason, it makes it harder to sleep. But I'm getting a bit better at, like, letting things go before bed and just (laughs) being able to clear my mind, relax. (laughs) Mm. But it's been a journey. (laughs) Yeah. So should we start off with a little bit of a definition of what is sleep? So in case you haven't guessed, this episode is our eight (laughs) hours of sleep. (laughs) We're we're not sure if we articulated that. (laughs) The funny thing is, I often like joke, what is sleep as a phrase when I'm not sleeping very much? You know, when you're like, what is sleep? Mm. You know, I don't need it. You'll sleep when you're dead. (laughs) (laughs) But this is a, a good question to actually answer in terms of what is sleep. I have a little bit of information about sleep and what it is from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. All righty. I'm ready. So they say that we spend about a third of our time sleeping and then quality sleep and getting enough of it at the right times is as essential to survival as food and water. 
And without sleep, you can't form or maintain the pathways in your brain that let you learn and create new memories, and it's harder to concentrate and respond quickly. They also say that sleep is important to a number of your brain functions, including how nerve cells, which we call neurons, communicate with each other. And in fact, your brain and body stay remarkably active while you sleep. Recent findings suggest that sleep plays a housekeeping role that removes toxins in your brain that build up while you're awake. So sleep is pretty important, <laughs> I guess, is the, is the general sense from this article. Yes. Yeah. So but now the question that we're asking is like, how much sleep do you need to get? Yeah, and I'm curious how we got to the number of eight hours, because I know that the amount you sleep as a newborn, for example, is way more than you sleep when you're elderly, right? So how did eight hours just become the number that we always throw out? I turned to the CDC to get some hard numbers on sleep. I can tell you what they have by age group. Yeah, that sounds good. According to the CDC, and also the CDC refers to the National Sleep Foundation, So they say newborns who are zero to three months require 14 to 17 hours of sleep. That makes sense. Infants who are four to 12 months are 12 to 16 hours per 24 hours, including naps. Toddlers who are one to two years, so they're 11 to 14 hours per 24 hours, also including naps. Preschool, which is three to five years, 10 to 13 hours per 24 hours, including naps again. And then once you hit like school age, so 6 to 12, then you need 9 to 12 hours per 24 hours. Teens, which are 13 to 18, is 8 to 10 hours. Adults, 18 to 60 years, are 7 or more hours per night. 61 to 64 years is 7 to 9 hours. And then 65 years and older is 7 to 8 hours. I think it's really sad that they stop putting including naps once you hit six years old. (laughs) If anything, naps become more important. (laughs) (laughs) Your naps don't count anymore. It could just be that at those ages, you're less likely to take naps, so they don't have enough data. So I guess that eight hours, like for adults, if we think of the age group that we would be in, which would be the 18 to 60, Mm -hmm. Seven or more hours per night, I guess eight would be included in there. And then if you look at the average for people a little older, like seven to nine, eight's smack dab in the middle. Yeah. One thing that I did notice about these recommendations is that as you get older, less sleep is recommended. Yeah, I miss those 14 to 17 hour days. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember them? (laughs) No, absolutely not. But I imagine that they were good. (laughs) I can imagine. Well, sometimes I look over at my cats as they sleep for like 17 hours a day, probably. And I'm like, you don't know how good you've got it. (laughs) Yeah. I'd like to be a house cat one day. I think it's a good life. I did look into the methodology section that uh, the National Sleep Foundation used in order to come to these recommendations. And they used a panel method, um, specifically the RAND slash UCLA appropriateness method, which is a two-round modified Delphi process. And if you're wondering what a Delphi process is, this is a process used by a group to arrive at a decision, the group being like a panel of experts. Okay, so it's just maybe a procedure to go through to account for everyone's expertise and Yeah, and like systematically account for everyone's expertise and make sure everyone is heard and everyone's opinions are weighted appropriately. Okay, so this sounds like a pretty rigorous methodology. Yeah, so in this case, they had an 18-member multidisciplinary panel comprised of sleep researchers, physicians, and experts in the areas of medicine, physiology, and science, which was assembled by the National Sleep Foundation. All righty. This might be a little bit too granular, but 12 representatives were selected by stakeholder organizations and six sleep experts were appointed by the NSF on the panel. And then some of the representatives were from organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Anatomists, 
the American College of Chess Physicians, American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, and what happens in this process is a systematic literature review identified 312 articles that met all of the criteria that these people were going to review. And all of these studies appeared within the literature within the past 10 years, and the population described in that study had to be a normal population. So I guess they did kind of what we've talked about in other episodes of, you know, a systematic review of the literature. They have specific criteria for the quality mm -hmm. of the literature that they're looking at, what the literature studied, so that they can review it and come to the best consensus possible. So basically, the experts reviewed the studies and they had to give an appropriateness score. So inappropriate being one to three, uncertain being four to six, and then appropriate being seven to nine. So I guess they looked at all the different times that you can sleep and were like, zero hours is a bad <laughs> idea. 24 <laughs> is also quite extreme. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle is our, you know, appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Appropriateness is also meant for like overall health and well-being, as well as cognitive, physical, and emotional health. Mm. They also noted whether they were voting based on convincing scientific evidence, weaker scientific evidence, expert opinion, or their own experience. Right. So we really have experts in this field reviewing the literature, voting in a very controlled way that should be as free from bias as we can have with something where humans are involved. So yes. I guess they, they voted on it, right? Yeah. So there's two rounds of voting. So round one, as we've described, where they, they read them and they vote individually. And then the second round of voting occurs immediately following discussion and debate about each age group during an in-person meeting. Um, and then when possible, the panel tries to reach consensus. However, no effort is made to eliminate disagreement in their second round of voting. Okay, so if there's disagreements, they just let them coexist. Yes. There's no push that we have to agree on one single number. Yeah, it's not like a jury. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The sleep duration recommendations were formulated using the median appropriateness scores and were classified as appropriate, which are scores ranging from seven to nine with agreement, may be appropriate for some people, which is a score greater than four with disagreement, and unlikely to be appropriate, which is a score less than or equal to three with agreement. Wow. So you can have, I guess, a good degree of confidence in the numbers that we're hearing that like, yeah, that is the range that we should be aiming for with our sleep. They've gone to a great deal of effort to to make this voting, I guess, as free from external biases as possible. With any method, though, there are limitations. So what are some of the limitations of doing the RAND UCLA appropriateness method? I'm glad you asked because you're right. Limitations always exist. So we can start off with the limitations that come from the studies themselves, right? Mm, so yes. a lot of this data is self-reported. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Every scientist is just like... <sighs> <laughs> yeah, so a lot of sleep data is self-reported. And if you know anything about self-reporting... Sometimes you just don't want to admit to it, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell someone I slept 17 minutes one night. <laughs> I'm going to be like, no, I think I got to bed at a good time. So that's one of the biggest uh, limitations with these reports that were used. Um, the other thing is that a lot of the data is like total bedtime rather than sleep time. I feel like that number, if they did this during the pandemic, would be extremely skewed. No judgment, by the way. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, no judgment. We all did what we needed to to survive. <laughs> yeah, it was a tough time. Yeah. But those are some of the limitations. Self-reporting and then a lot of the data is how much time you're sp has spent in bed and not necessarily how much time is spent sleeping. Right, right. That makes sense. But even then, I feel like the numbers that we do have kind of fit within the larger body of science, obviously, in the consensus and, like, recommendations for our health. And it's not something really 
unusual or unexpected, right? So it's not mm-hmm. like, like, I think we all kind of know when we get a good night's sleep and it often tends to be somewhere in the range that they're giving us. Although seven yeah. hours seems like a little light. I'm a little bit on the lighter end. Seven is pretty good for me, I would say. But then I don't know if you're going to talk about sleep debt because I feel like sometimes I'm, I've collected a lot of sleep debt that I need to make up on the weekends. Oh, we will talk about sleep debt. But before we get there, mm-hmm. I have to ask, as Canadians, how are we doing? Are we getting enough sleep? Canadians, like probably the rest of the world, don't get enough sleep. So, <laughs> so I found some numbers. The recommendation for like 18 to 64 is 7 to 9 hours. And then 65 is 7 to 8, as we discussed. In Canada, one in four adults aged 18 to 34, and then one in three aged 35 to 64, and one in four aged 65 to 79 are not getting enough sleep. So about like 28, 30% of Canadians are not getting enough sleep. A good portion of us are not sleeping enough. So I guess that segues nicely to what you mentioned, which is sleep debt, right? Because if we're not getting enough sleep, we do have what we have termed as sleep debt. And that's basically like the difference between how much you actually slept and how much you you needed to <laughs> needed to based on your age group. So like, for example, if you only slept five hours mm-hmm. and you're between the ages of 18 and 64, the recommendations are seven to nine. You know, you have a sleep debt of like two to four hours from that night that you didn't you didn't meet the recommendation. And I think the question that always comes up is, can we atone for that by sleeping more on the weekends? (laughs) Because we talked about that a bit at the beginning. Like, we both kind of tend to let it go a bit on the weekends. Like, maybe change the wake-up time a bit. We also Mm -hmm. probably tend to go to bed a little bit later. I feel like you're about to, like, dash my hopes and dreams, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) So I was desperately hoping that <laughs> that, that <laughs> weekend sleep that we would make up would be like magical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they would be like, yes, this is the best thing you can do for your health. <laughs> <laughs> I found a different answer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> There's an article that I looked at that was published in Cell Current Biology, which is a scientific journal. Um, And it was titled, Ad Libitum Weekend Recovery Sleep Fails to Prevent Metabolic Dysregulation During a Repeating Pattern of Insufficient Sleep and Weekend Recovery Sleep. Okay. So I'm going to break down this study. That title kind of has a lot going on. This was a study that looked at a few different variables. So they wanted to look at sleep. They wanted to look at circadian rhythm. So that's kind of the internal clock that we all have that tells us when to get sleepy and when to wake up and when our optimal level of alertness is and all those things. And then they also wanted to look at energy intake, weight gain, and insulin sensitivity during sustained insufficient sleep. So when you're not sleeping enough, is your body still reacting to insulin the same way that it is when you are sleeping well? Question. Why is insulin so important? Well, insulin is really important because insulin tells our body to take up glucose out of the blood, so sugar, essentially. So if you think about when your body doesn't respond to insulin correctly, Mm -hmm. you can have diabetes develop, right? So, okay. for example, type 2 diabetes is when the insulin receptors in your body stop responding to insulin the same way that they do when everything's functioning normally. So it's like a good indicator of whether or not your body is operating as it should. From the perspective of energy intake, metabolism, all those things, right? Okay. Because we need to take up the sugar into our body so that we can use it for energy. And there's consequences if you have high levels of sugar circulating around in your body, in the blood, because you don't have enough insulin. All right. This study looked at three different groups. So like all studies, control group, very important. So they had people who had a nine-hour sleep opportunity consistently. That's like the white whale. (laughs) (laughs) Nine Uh, hours consistent. Wow. 
So the next group had sleep restriction. So they had a five-hour sleep opportunity daily without weekend recovery. So think finals. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's like, that's like go time. Yeah. The next group are people who had sleep restrictions. So again, that insufficient sleep of uh, like a five-hour sleep opportunity for five days. So kind of simulating that work week. And then they had two days of weekend recovery. And then that was followed by two nights of that sleep restriction again so that they could capture like what's happening to your body when the sleep restriction is happening, what's happening when you get that recovery, and then what happens if it becomes a cycle and that sleep restriction is reintroduced. So we are most like the third group. I yo-yo kind of like that group. Yeah. So what they found basically was that the groups that had sleep restrictions, so they had that decreased opportunity for sleep, had a higher after-dinner energy intake. So I interpret that as snacking. (laughs) (laughs) And then they also experienced an increased body weight compared to their baseline before the study. The difference, though, is those who had their weekend recovery sleep tended to sleep about an hour, 1.1 hours more than they did on their baseline. And after dinner, energy intake decreased, but only temporarily. Mm. So on those days after their weekend recovery, so this is like after you've had that weekend, you're relaxed, and then you're back on that grind, they experienced a slowed circadian phase. And so that after dinner energy intake increased and their body weight also increased again. And then we talked about how important insulin is. Those groups that had sleep restriction, they had decreased 13% whole body insulin sensitivity compared to their baseline. Which probably contributes to the weight gain, I'm guessing. Yeah, contributes that whole cascade of metabolic dysregulation. And then the group that had that weekend recovery had their whole body, their hepatic, and their muscle insulin sensitivity affected by 9 to 27% negatively. So they had a bigger issue. <laughs> so so what you're saying is, is that it's actually more dangerous to yo-yo than just to restrict. In this very short period of time, right? So we're looking at people over like nine days. And we'll talk a bit more about those long-term outcomes. But in this kind of short-term nine-day snapshot, that recovery doesn't make up for the sleep that you already lost. Ah. Uh. So... Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. (laughs) Sleep debt is not a real thing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the debt is real. The repayment. (laughs) There's interest. (laughs) (laughs) So, Lindsay, we talked about short-term outcomes of not getting enough sleep. But what are the long-term effects if you're not getting enough sleep? That was my question, too. Like, what happens to us long term if we're, for example, in grad school and we don't sleep (laughs) enough for a year? (laughs) Yeah, because I I basically spent 10 months depriving myself of sleep. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What are we looking at here? What's the damage? (laughs) So I found what I think is a very strong study. It was published in Sleep Medicine, which is an academic journal, and it's titled Short Sleep Duration and Health Outcomes, A Systematic Review, Meta-Analysis, and Meta-Regression. It's from 2017, and we've already introduced in past episodes a bit about what is a systematic review, what is a meta-analysis. But essentially what this does is, you know, with a systematic review, you systematically go through all of the literature in usually several different databases, and you have some criteria that you're looking for in studies, maybe the type of study, the duration of follow-up. Exactly. Yeah, to make sure that they're rigorous enough to be part of your review. Totally. Often, if you're also doing a meta-analysis, you aggregate the data that they had, and you analyze it all together. So you're basically combining studies to make a mega study that will take into account a lot bigger sample size or um, really give you a good overview of like where's the body of literature and like what's the level of evidence for something. So this article did 
a systematic review, a meta-analysis with that data aggregation, and also a meta-regression. They were looking at prospective cohort studies or randomized controlled trials. So I'll give a few definitions of this because we have talked about it in past episodes, but it's always good to review. So randomized controlled trials are prospective and um, prospective cohort studies, you know, we keep hearing this word prospective. So what that means is really that participants are joining the study before they develop the outcome in question. So if you're looking to see if, you know, there's maybe a reduction in symptoms with a new drug, that reduction in symptoms hasn't started before they join the the trial, right? So it's nice because you're not looking back (laughs) to see what happened and, and you're able to control things a bit more. A cohort study is one that's really a cohort or a group of people with some characteristics that are sampled over time. A more official definition, if you want, could be like a group of people with defined characteristics who are followed up to determine instance of or mortality from some specific disease or all causes of death or some other outcome. For example, a cohort could be people I don't know, in grad school who are only getting five hours of sleep and you check in with them like every year. Yeah, you follow them or you follow them throughout their grad school and then follow up years afterwards. Exactly. Okay. And with a randomized controlled trial, this is one where we're, we're trying to control for any confounding variables possible, right? So there, mm-hmm. you know, people are randomly assigned to treatment or control group. There's blinding, ideally. So, you know, the people measuring the outcomes of, you know, for example, sleep or grad school or whatever they're looking at, they don't know who's in which group. And ideally, the people in the groups also shouldn't know. I believe that's called like double blind, right? Yes. And then there's also triple blinding where um, the people doing the statistical analyses don't know which group is which. So the studies that they looked at from the literature, they all followed up with participants for at least a year, and they looked at the association between having a short sleep time, which is defined as less than six hours in this study, and then an association between like various outcomes, so mortality or the incidence of different health issues like diabetes, for example. So what ended up happening is they had two study groups from their aggregated data. So they had those short sleepers sleeping less than six hours, and they had their normal sleepers sleeping more than that. And they compared the outcomes in those groups of, you know, mortality, developing different health conditions, using what's called a risk ratio. So I got a definition from the CDC. Basically, what a risk ratio is, it's sometimes also called relative risk. What it does is it compares the risk of a health event, so developing a disease or having an injury or dying, for example, among one group, and then they compare that risk to another group. Basically, you divide the risk, which is the incidence proportion or attack rate, so like the rate at which people in that one group have a heart attack, for example, and you divide it by that same rate in the other group. So for example, your... In your control group. Yeah, your control group is always what you're comparing it to. Um, And you can separate things by demographic factors, by exposures, and you end up with a ratio. So if you have a ratio of one, it means that the risk in those two groups is identical. But if you have a risk ratio greater than one, it means there's an increased risk in that group that had you know, that kind of primary interest. So maybe in this case, it'd be our short sleepers. It means that they would have an increased risk of whatever we're looking at. And then conversely, if the number was less than one, there would be some sort of protective element to whatever it is that you're looking at. So the short sleepers would, you know, have a decreased risk of mortality or something. And then you could work from there and try to figure out why. (laughs) (laughs) And it's important to note too, that if a risk ratio if the number you get and then your confidence interval of that number. So how sure you are that the true value is actually somewhere in that range. Yeah. If that crosses one, it's not statistically significant, which means that... Then it it could be chance, right? It's not... You don't have any reason to suggest that there's a, a difference. It could just be like randomness in your experiment. 
So what did this study find? (laughs) (laughs) The reason I said that this is quite an impressive study is that they included 108 studies. They had 153 data sets. And they had 5,172,710 participants that they included. It's a lot of people. Huge sample size. Mm -hmm. Huge. So what they found was that short sleepers had a significantly higher relative risk of mortality. The number that they got from their risk ratio or relative risk was 1.12. So increased risk over that one. Mm -hmm. And their 95% confidence interval was from 1.08 to 1.16. So not crossing one, statistically significant. And other outcomes were quite similar. So short sleepers had a significantly higher risk ratio of diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, coronary heart diseases, obesity, But one of the things is they didn't have enough data to look at depression or troubles with fat in your body, so dyslipidemia. And then what they did with their meta-regression is they found that the relationship between how much you sleep and the association with these problems is dose-dependent. So there's a dose response for when you sleep less than six hours, and that gives you a statistically significant increase in mortality. So I guess the take home here would be to try and get at least six hours of sleep. (laughs) Yeah, at six hours, we're seeing that increase with mortality, that increase with really challenging health conditions like, you know, cardiovascular diseases. All right. I guess this is like my wake up call in a sense that I should sleep more. (laughs) Yes. But the question is, how much more? Ah, So one of the interesting things is like you sometimes hear that sleeping a lot is sometimes just as bad as not sleeping enough. One thing that's really cool is that the same research team that did this big systematic review and meta-analysis for short sleepers did the exact same thing on long sleepers. (laughs) So it's titled Long Sleep Duration and Health Outcomes, a Systematic Review, Meta-Analysis, and Meta-Regression. They did very similar methods. This time, long sleep is defined as more than nine hours. And they looked at the same thing, right? The dose relationship between long sleep duration and health outcomes like that mortality, diabetes, high blood pressure. And they ended up with kind of a similar number of participants. So they had 137 prospective cohort studies for a sample size of 5,134,036 participants. So what they found was that long sleep was significantly associated with mortality. And one thing that I find interesting is it had a higher risk ratio. Oh, so this is like consistently long sleep, like consistently more than nine hours every night. Yes. Okay. So 1.39 was the risk ratio and their confidence interval was 1.31 to 1.47. Hmm. And again, they had that significant association with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, coronary heart disease, obesity, but it wasn't related significantly to hypertension or high blood pressure, which is a difference between long and short sleep. Okay. And like the the short sleeping one, they didn't have enough data for depression and lipid issues. So I guess... Somewhere between six to nine hours is optimal sleep. Yeah, (laughs) which fits with our our eight hours. Yeah, with our recommendations. And what I think is interesting is we really have this development of like a Goldilocks zone of sleep. But one of the keys, I guess, is just because you're in bed for eight hours doesn't mean you're actually like sleeping those eight hours. Mm. So it's hard to, to find that sweet spot and get in that rhythm. So be kind to yourself as you try to hit that, that bullseye of, of how long to sleep. So, Lev, yes. I have a question for you. Go for it. Are you a night owl or an early bird? <laughs> I'm definitely a night owl. So I'm not surprised. (laughs) I guess this is maybe the perfect example of I'm more of an early bird. You're more of a night owl. I prefer the quiet at night 
than the quiet t- in the morning. Like I find that at nighttime, it's easier for me to focus and like just like dial in to whatever it is I need to do. No matter what time I wake up, I always feel like a little discombobulated if I go to bed way too late. Mm. So this brings up kind of an interesting discussion of what's known as chronotypes. So basically, there was a psychiatrist in Germany who's named Emil Kreplin or Kreplin. Please forgive my pronunciation. (laughs) (laughs) And around the turn of the 20th century, he started to notice in his patients, like, different tendencies that existed. And he ended up calling them chronotypes. So his definition is it's the natural tendency dictating when a person is energetic or sleepy throughout the day. So he's the one who kind of gave us, you know, the the night owl, the early bird. And one thing that's interesting is like that can change throughout your lifetime. So like if you think of teenagers, <laughs> their chronotype yeah. is different than like a grandma. I feel like the, like your grandma's definitely the early bird and like teenage Lavanya was a night owl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what like elderly Lavanya <laughs> This will be a small core heart study. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I find interesting, though, since then, they've identified other chronotypes. So you have our night owls, our early birds. Then they also identified afternooners. <laughs> okay. So these are people that are most sleepy when they wake up really early. Their peak alertness is 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then they get sleepy again. They also have nappers. <laughs> Okay. So these are people that wake up really early, and then at 11 a.m., they have this kind of slump that they hit, so an energy drop. And then Mm. at 3 p.m., it, like, picks up again, and they keep working till about, like, 10. Mm. One thing that's interesting is, like, if you think about conventional things in society, like school, a typical 9-to-5 job, like, this is really set up for an early bird. And... It would be interesting what would happen if we had more flexibility in that. Like maybe we're getting there with the pandemic and like people working from home and and there's kind of this more like fluided work style. Yeah, but it just it seems like the world in some respects is set up for early birds to succeed and for our night owls to be left behind. <laughs> yeah. So a company in Denmark actually tried this flexibility. The company's called ABV, it's spelled A-B-B-V-I-E, and they're a global pharmaceutical company in Denmark. And what they did is they put employees through chronotype training, and they then structured workdays around employees' personal rhythms. Hmm. So meetings would happen when all employees are present, so during like those overlap times between the different chronotypes. Ten years later... Employee satisfaction at the company went from 39% to almost 100%. Oh, wow. And efficiency increased. So maybe chronotype training is our future? Maybe. Whatever chronotype you are, we can kind of summarize this as try to hit that sweet spot, no matter when you're going to bed or waking up, of getting between no less than six hours and no more than nine. Consistently. Try to find that consistency. (laughs) Yeah. It's now time to plant our science seed. Each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about. A science nugget to help you think more critically about the numbers, statistics, and science that you hear every day. Today's science seed is all about how we arrive at numbers that we do. Mm -hmm. So, Lavanya, do you want to take it away? Yeah, so I guess today we're really talking about surveying in like a systematic way. Because as we'd mentioned in this episode, in order to come to those recommendations for sleep... The National Sleep Foundation went through a very rigorous process of polling, and then there was a panel afterwards, and then more polling. You can compare this to what was done in the market research that we discussed for ghosts, for example. Yeah, with ghosts, it was very different. 
your results are only as good as the data that you collect. So if you collect so-so data from like a questionable sample, then you don't know if it really applies to like the entire population. But if you make the effort to like systematically review and like hold panels and pull more than once and get agreement in some cases, then you can be more confident in your results and your recommendations. A hundred percent. That's all for this episode. But if you have a burning question about what we talked about today or any of the topics that we've covered, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your question, and we might answer it in our post-season two bonus episode of Listener Questions. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we used for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. Have an idea of what number we should cover next? Want to learn more about what we talked about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Mm-hmm.